Well, hi, this is the In Context Podcast. We are discussing current events and biblical theology through the lens of what Scripture has to say about these things. We are recording at a church, an EFCA church in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, called Stonebridge Church. My name is Keith, and I'm joined by... Brandon. And if you're used to uh, listening to us... This is probably the least off the rails entrance I've ever given to this podcast. I'm trying to. It was until you acknowledged it. I know I can't. I can't not do it. I just feel (laughs) weird. Sometimes it's weird just talking into microphones. Um, I mentioned that we were an EFCA church. Uh, We have been going through. If you've been listening, you know this already. If you're not, if you've not been listening, we're going through the EFCA statement of faith, uh, and we are just sharing a little bit more detail into what it is that our denomination believes and and why we take the approach that we do. We have come to um, Christ's return, and this is the second week spending time on talking about Christ's return. The reason we split this up is because there is a lot to cover when we're talking about Christ's return, and we always want to make sure that we um, take our time to go through some of these things because especially when we get to uh, views on the millennium, what what is the millennium? What Mm -hmm. are the views on that? How do those divide uh, a number of uh, major positions when it comes to end times? We're going to start talking about these things today. Amen. Yes. So by way of reminder, um, and again, we're, we're launching off of everything we talked about last week, um, with article nine, but article nine reads, we believe in the personal bodily and glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ. The coming of Christ at a time known only to God demands constant expectancy. And as our blessed hope motivates the believer to godly living, sacrificial service and energetic mission. Now, one might wonder, why are you talking about millennium when the word's not even (laughs) in Article 9? Well, it it, was. It was. It was. (laughs) As we explained last week, um, up until 2018, uh, the EFCA statement was specifically premillennial. Right. Uh, That word was replaced with glorious, um, largely because one's millennial position is not an essential to the gospel. Mm -hmm. And we want to major on the majors um, as a denomination. That said, one's position still matters. Well, it's important. Uh, we don't mm-hmm. divide over it, but it affects the way we read Scripture. It affects how we operate in, in different areas of life. And so while it's not an all-important question, it's still an important question and a complex question. And yeah. so that's why we wanted to, to devote a, a whole episode to it today. Yeah, and it's a mistake for us. You'll hear some people say what we're not saying, and what we sh- what we shouldn't say is that it doesn't matter. Correct. Some people will say, "Well, it doesn't really matter where you land on this." It, like you said, it does. It does matter where you land on this. It's in the Bible. It's in the it Bible. matters, right? So if we just throw, <laughs> and that's the the detriment of discussing some of the the millennial positions in eschatology, is it can be to where we almost just throw out Revelation, like, well, you know. Who even knows? I'm like, well, listen, I God wouldn't have put it in the Bible if he didn't. Mean, God doesn't mean for us to not understand Correct. the word. And Correct. that's so the the what we tend to do is say, well, we can't understand it. We should yeah. try too hard. We should never take that position with scripture. It's yeah, worth absolutely. wrestling through, even if we land at different. Yeah, positions there's, a, there's a difference between uh, intentional ignorance yeah. and humility. Yes. We're aiming for humility in our posture, not an intentional ignorance or kind of a naive positivism where we just kind of stick our head in the sand and don't. Right. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, We want to wrestle. We want to wrestle, but we want to do so humbly. Yep. Um, And and kind of our approach with that today is is to review what are the major positions on this uh, question and maybe share some evaluation and critique uh, of some of them as we go, but hopefully in a spirit of, of humility and, and again, putting everything in the context of Scripture. Right. And when we talk about eschatology, you're going to find uh, a mul- multiplicity of passages that, are, that have yep. informed the positions that we take. Um, the biggest of which is really Revelation 20 is probably especially the, with the, the millennium That's specifically. Right. Yeah. Uh, but then you're also, also looking at the Daniel um, specifically, specifically like chapter seven, um, 
uh, and beyond. Um, the Olivet Discourse. Olivet Discourse, Matthew, Matthew 24. 24. That's right. Um, so those those would be the... Now, Thessalonians 2, we talked about this a little bit last week. That'll bring in some of those positions. But um, a lot of the questions where a lot of the confusion comes down to is what do we mean when we're talking about the quote-unquote millennium or 1,000 years? Yeah. Like, what are we talking yeah. about? Um, and here's uh, there's a great resource on a, w- one of my favorite uh, biblical resource websites called monergism.com. Um, And uh, there's just a little sheet here on just uh, outlining the major views of the millennium. I think the questions um, that they that they use that are being asked and then the positions are helpful. So I'm just going to read the questions when we're talking about uh, the millennial views or these views of this thousand years in Christ's return. um, When the uh, eight questions, one, when is the when is the millennium? Is it past? Is it present or future? Second, when will Jesus return, before or after the millennium? Uh, number three, what does the binding of Satan refer to? Uh, we see that in Revelation 20. Most of these questions are coming from Revelation 20, uh, verses 1 through 8. Um, number four, is the thousand years a literal period of time? Uh, five, what is the, quote, first resurrection that we see in verses 4 through 6? What is the second death? Question number six. Question number seven, what and when will the rapture be? And number eight, what will the world be like until Christ returns? And really, these are the main, the eight questions that sort of tell you, you know, indicate where you land on which one of these millennial positions. And and just to define the millennium, you know, if you're listening Mm -hmm. and you're like, I thought that was just, you know... calendar thing or whatever <laughs> or millennials what do you have against millennials well it turns um, out no i'm just kidding i'm kidding it's joke. so so in theology and scripture when we talk about the millennium we're talking about the events described in revelation 21 mm-hmm. to 8 like mm-hmm. keith just mentioned mm-hmm. i'm just going to read that real fast yeah it's good like what so the question becomes what are these events when will they happen all the questions that ju- that keith just uh, ran through but here's here's the passage itself revelation 20 Verse 1, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. There's where we get our word millennium. Uh, For a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That There's a millennial mm-hmm. reign. Mm-hmm. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for the battle, for their number is like the sand on the sea. And then it talks about them marching up and having the... Well, I'll just read 9 and 10. Yeah. They marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the, and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil, who had deceived them, was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, see chapter 19. Mm-hmm. And they will, be torm- they, they will be tormented day and night there forever and ever. Right. Easy reading. Easy stuff. <laughs> Case closed. <laughs> Well, clearly, clearly, clear, obviously, uh, this obvi- means it's this. obvious it's happening there. It's obvious who Gog and Magog are as well, <laughs> depending on who you ask. <laughs> or what or, internet rabbit? Yeah, or which? Down. Yeah, which which side of the dark biblical web you're on? <laughs> um, <laughs> so let's go through. Let's walk through some positions here. To kind of talk about generally what we're saying when we use the term. Um, and then maybe we can go through the positions that they state and the possible objections to those. Yeah, that sounds work? good. Okay. So when we talk about amillennialism, uh, so the question like when is the millennium, when, when this thousand years that we're mm-hmm. talking about, uh, when is it? In amillennialism, it's now. 
It's yeah. the entire period of time from Christ's first coming to his second. Now, yeah. here's a tell, too. As we read some of these, what's funny is if we would go through these and read these, if we read them in sequence, a lot of people would be like, yeah, I believe that. But then the next position, they'd be like, yeah, I believe that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and there is a significant degree of overlap that's right. among various positions. That's right. And that's what makes it so tricky yeah. is we accidentally, and you may find out, um, there may be some things that you would say if somebody asked you what position you were and you'd hear a couple of these, you'd mm-hmm. say, well, I'm that. But then mm-hmm. you'll hear something from other positions yeah. and say, well, no, but I believe that. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of commonalities. And, and you'll notice before we get into Amelie, you'll notice that most of the categories are defined with time markers. That's right. You know, so ah, mm-hmm. me, which is the Greek kind of negation of not, right. not you know, uh, post, pre. Now the ah is not that the position doesn't believe in a millennium. That's right. But it's not a future millennium. Right. Whereas pre and post would both see the the, the events of Revelation 20 being something in the future. Yeah. Ah sees it as already started right. and continuing until Christ's return. Yeah, I grew up a dispensationalist, which we'll get there at some point. But yep. uh, when I the first time I heard somebody talk about amillennialism, I thought... They don't even believe in it. I know. And it's, it's really kind of an inaugurated scandalous. millennialism right. is a better term, that's in good. my opinion. Yeah, that's right. So in, in that position, amillennialism, it's now. So like when Christ came until Christ returns, yeah, it's, it's, it's we're already in the millennium. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, secondly, uh, Jesus returns after the millennium. Yeah. It's a very, very easy again. So like that when the, millenn- the millennium is done, when Christ return. returns. Yeah. Right. Uh, third, what does the binding of Satan to uh, refer to? The binding of Satan refers to the gospel's worldwide advance. So it's not a physical binding of Satan. It's a spiritual binding yeah. of the power of Satan to just do whatever he wants yeah. on the earth. A- a- absolutely. And there will, there will be variations on each of these points right. within adherence of each position. That's right. Uh, with the binding of Satan, you know, some positions are going to see that as in the future, there's mm-hmm. going to be a time when Satan has like no capability to do anything. That's right. An amillennialist would see uh, the binding specifically in verse uh, 3 so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until... And then what is this deception doing? If you drop down to um, the uh, 7 and 8, he's going to come out to deceive the nations and gather them for battle. Mm -hmm. So it's a very specific binding. He's going to be kept from... Deceiving the nations for the final battle, right? Um, and in, but it doesn't mean he's not active in deception. It doesn't right. mean he's not active in. Uh, a non-millennialist would see uh, parallels between Revelation twelve and mm-hmm. Revelation twenty mm-hmm. in terms of the the limitation of of Satan's ability, but not necessarily the elimination of it right. until the end. Right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what is the, is the thousand years a literal period of time and amillennialism? We've already established this really. It's figurative. It's a mm-hmm. long period of time. It's not a thousand yeah. actual years. And I will just say when you get to numbers in scripture, it can get pretty tricky, especially in apocalyptic literature, especially in apocalyptic, but in general too, like you have the idea of like even seven being perfection or completion mm-hmm. and, and six being in completion, mm-hmm, which is why mm-hmm. you get even in you the 666, six, 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 yeah. six. mm-hmm. it's incomplete. It's not quite there. It's not what it's supposed to be, which is why it's the the Antichrist, yeah, the number. Yeah. It's an imperfect number. But um, so it 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 is difficult. Absolutely. It is difficult to, to when you get to these numbers. Um, what is the first resurrection? Amillennialism would say that the first rec- resurrection uh, refers to the intermediate state of believers, like what's like so the kind after of the death state, spiritual resurrection That's right. in heaven. That's right, and the spiritual coming to life or the regeneration of those who believe the gospel. Yeah. So that's how they would parse that out. Yeah. So when we're talking about Revelation twenty, okay. and that would be somewhat similar to uh, John five twenty five to mm-hmm. twenty eight, when Jesus is talking about resurrection, and the first thing he's talking about is people being raised Mm -hmm. spiritually, and then he's talking about them being raised physically. physically. The second resurrection would be the physical resurrection. Right, right. Um, The second death, what is the second death? The second death refers to hell, so that's the second death. 
Um, what and when will the rapture be? Uh, the rapture in amillennialism is the public event that takes place at Christ's second coming when believers who are still living at the time are caught up and transformed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you'll, you'll have variations on that one too. You will. But it, as opposed to say, when we get down further, like with a, with a, um, a dispensational premillennial view where the rapture is the, and this is the traditional understanding. Like if you say the word rapture this today, people are thinking, right? most people are thinking a time when the church is caught up and right. taken to heaven while Israel's left on earth for the right. tribulation, all of that. Right. In all millennialism, there's not this gap between the coming of Christ and the, and you know, mm-hmm. So we'll get into some of that. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Rather, the new creation and resurrection are happening at his second coming. Mm -hmm. And so the rapture is simply the welcoming party Mm -hmm. where in 1 Corinthians 15, where, you know, uh, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. changed. You know, those who are still living on the earth when the Lord returns will receive their resurrection bodies in a different way than those who are already in the ground. So that's kind of the... Yeah, Yeah, that's right. And then uh, last, what will the world be like until Christ returns? And the answer is, well, both evil and good will continue to increase side by side until Christ returns, yep. which is pretty, you know. Parable of the wheat, of the right, wheat, wheat and the tares. tares. Yep. Mm-hmm. Let them grow together. And then at the end, they'll be separated. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. Uh, let's do this. Let's move on. Let, we'll come back to objections after we get through all these. Let's, we, let's put them side by side and then we can go back and talk a little bit more. So post-millennialism, if you're taking notes, it might be helpful for you to write some of these things down. I can also uh, uh, provide a link to a, a paper that has some these things written down on it. Uh, post-millennialism, the millennium is future. It's a period of worldwide Christian triumph when the kingdom of God is dramatically unveiled in history. It's a really great way to put that. Yes. But like, yes, it's a, it's a future... Um, in which everything becomes more and more glorious. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, secondly, when will Jesus return? Well, Jesus will return after the yeah. millennium. Again, how you're defining the millennium yeah. is is the important thing. And and with with post millennialism, there's there's almost two streams of that right. of what will what will be the point? How will we know when the millennium's here? Right. Uh, your your Puritan views of that because. Um, Post-millennial, post-millennialism Talk was say, very yeah. popular among Puritans like Jonathan Edwards, Edwards and yeah. others. Mm-hmm. A lot of the Puritans who, who you know, were in New England and whatnot. Theirs was a primarily a view of the advance of the gospel, the mm-hmm. evangelization of the world. Mm-hmm. So you think of Matthew, um, I think it's 24, maybe 25, where he talks about this gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth and then the end will come. Mm-hmm. They, they saw their mandate as if it, the end will come and their definition is then the millennial kingdom will be ushered in type mm-hmm. thing. So as the gospel advances, uh, we'll get to a place where the world is so Christianized or evangelized mm-hmm. that the millennium will begin. The other stream is more of a uh, what you would maybe call a dominion theology right. where it's not the evangelization of the individuals, but the Christianization of the nations, whether or not they're regenerate or not, right. but the the overt establishment of Christ's rule on the earth. And mm. so when that happens widespread enough, then the millennium is right. here, and after this millennium, Christ will return. Right, which is what you just encapsulated was the, the position on the binding of Satan, right? Mm. Like the binding of Satan is a reference to the gospel's worldwide advance and as well a severe limiting of Satan's power, uh, yeah. both spiritually and Physically, yes, yes. So what what you were just talking about with dominion theology goes in line with theonomy, or mm-hmm. the and theon. If you don't know what theonomy is, theonomy is the rule of Christ's people, Christ's kingdom, in a way that enforces like even the second table of the law. Yeah, the mosaic. So, law. Yes, that's right. So the mosaic code, not not all of it in totality, but uh, in within the Ten Commandments, those main things. Like that's why we would uh, um, we would see. Uh, post millennials advocating for very strict uh, when it comes even like to abortion, giving the death penalty to mm. to those mm-hmm. who who have an abortion. Yeah. That you know you applying those things in that way. Not 
not everything unilaterally having a death penalty, but it's the it's the physic not just the spiritual rule of of God on the earth, but it would be the physical rule yeah. of God on and, the earth. And as so well. nations being op- operating under not just I, and I would say it's even it's not even just Christian law, but right. literally the Mosaic law. Mosaic law, yeah. Um, and uh, which you know lends into some of the, maybe the, the critiques we'll share later, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's, um, you know, that establishment of functionally trying to make what was true of ancient Israel, true of every nation in the world. Right. Like Israel becomes a parallel or an an analogy for how every nation should operate, Mm -hmm. um, regardless of whether or not that, the people, the people of that nation, of that nation are regenerate. Are, yeah, that's right. Um, so it's an establishment of, of the public physical rule. Christ is reigning in heaven. Every position, maybe not dispensational, but every position is going to acknowledge that Christ reigns in heaven right now. Right. And, and the, the caveat with dispensational is they're going to define the kingdom in a slightly different way where that phrase might not reflect the view. Um, how much... And in what way does that rain show up on earth? That's right. There's going to be differences there. And for right. post-millennial, it, it's going to increasingly become physically present right. in ways that uh, pre-millennial and amillennial will disagree with. Right. And if you study, you know, one of the, the buzz phrases in the past, I mean, eight years, especially politically, would be Christian nationalism. Mm-hmm. Um, and... If you dig deep enough, Christian nationalism isn't just an American applied term. It would be in any country mm-hmm. uh, if you were seeking to enforce and make the laws of that country, whether or not everybody in it is a Christian, if you were to make those laws distinctly Christian and punishable mm-hmm. uh, for offenses, that would be a type of Christian nationalism. Which you're you're running the dumb. That's right. Was functionally a Christian nationalism. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. And so y- you may, and again, this, this is why some of these things not only feed into what you think about the end times, but what do you think about how the church should behave and function yes. until Christ's return? Yes. Yeah. And, and that's where a lot of the implications are going to come. Okay, so moving on. Uh, what about the thousand years? The thousand years is a figurative number indicating a long period of time, right? This will go on and on and on and on. Um, number five, uh, the position of uh, what's the first resurrection. It's really the same as amillennialism. Basically, it's the intermediate state and the, the spiritual coming to life, the regeneration of those who believe the gospel. Um, what is the second death? The second death is hell, refers to hell. Um, number seven, what and when will the rapture be? Again, like amillennialism, the, the kingdom grows and grows and grows, and then uh, Jesus just shows up and wraps it all up. Okay. And then uh, eight, what will the world be like until Christ returns? And here's, again, the major difference based on what we were talking about is that good will ultimately triumph over evil as the millennium approaches and continues. So, again, things will get better and better and better and better and better. Yeah. And and the draw, one of the biggest draws, I think, of post-millennialism today is that optimism of, we, you know, being tired with the brokenness of the world right. and longing for uh, create for God's rule to be visibly present mm-hmm. in new ways. H- interestingly, like, historically, postmillennialism again was really popular among the uh, the Puritans. Uh, it it saw a dramatic, almost extinction uh, in the early twentieth century with oh, World, world War, War One. One. Yeah. Um, Virg- you know that was such a dark period right. that uh, the idea that things were going to get better just was gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it's it's we're seeing a resurgence of it from a, a few different factors um, uh, in, in recent years. Um, but it's interesting that the resurgence isn't typically isn't typically fueled by fresh eggs exegetical examinations of scripture right. but more responses to what's happening in the world like that's yeah. been the big factor both in the decline of postmillennialism and in its kind of renewal uh, in recent years it's not like i reread revelation 20 and i think this is what it says right. it's much more driven by reactions and and posture to uh what's going on in the world around that that's yeah. been what 
I've observed at least. Yeah, and I would say again, we will we'll get into the biblical critique here in in a little bit when we get through the rest of these positions. But I would say um, there's been an adaptation to postmillennialism where instead of saying it gets better and better and better and better, it's like you win some, you lose some, you win some, you win some, you lose some, you lose mm-hmm. some, but ultimately we'll gain more ground yeah, 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 yeah. than we lose. Um, but there's a strong, um, aggressive uh, attempt at motivating Christians mm-hmm. because we need to do better at winning some than losing some. Yeah. So there's there's an element in which you almost have to fuel a post-millennial position by uh, r- a lot of hard work and a lot yeah. of urging people. Yeah, and and it's interesting because the the desire to see culture changed by you know for the sake of Christ is not unique to post-millennial. Oh no, you not know, at all. Right. Every eschatological position will have a version of that. Sure. Um, reform theology, or, or I should say, uh, the more amillennial. Like you think of, um, oh no, I'm blanking on his name. Who's the Who's the the Dutch dude? Um, every square inch. Um, oh, Kuiper. Kuiper. Thank Abraham you. Kuiper. Yeah. So, so he was not post millennial, um, but he he would be more amillennial, as if I understand my history correctly. But he had a a vision for impacting culture for the sake of Christ. I think the difference is often. Uh, is it? Are we impacting it through influence or through authority? Right. Right. You know, post millennial will want. Obviously, they're going to want to influence, but they're wanting to going to want to influence to the point where they are now exercising authority, Christ's yeah. authority. Yeah. Whereas your amillennial culture shapers are going to want to uh, impact more through influence than author than than physical authority structures, government structures. Is no, that's that right. accurate? Yeah, Kuiper. Okay. Like Kuiper. Uh, the thing with Kuiper is Kuiper was trying to make alternatives to all the secular things that were happening. Yeah. So he Kuiper wasn't trying to eliminate every. Kuiper even would say like, "Hey, it's great to have Catholic schools," even though Kuiper would vehemently disagree with Catholic theology. Mm-hmm. He uh, he thought that it was a good thing to have multiple options in the sphere, and basically, let's see which one bears uh, mm-hmm. bears the most fruit. Now, yeah. ironically, <laughs> what happened with, as, as far as Kuiper is concerned, like he did a lot of really good work. He worked very very hard, and he left a really good legacy about how to see the world. The problem is now, uh, the Dutch are. Oh, yeah. Probably in much worse, <laughs> in yeah. a much worse state than they were before Kuiper did anything. But but again, now some of those things. What what makes this hard, and, and we're pausing to add commentary. But what makes eschatology hard is in a lot of these views there is this blue sky horizon in which we're looking towards. And if we can just do this and just do this, mm-hmm. the problem is even when we see these things being tried and being um, mm-hmm. being attempted in Christianity over the years. It, it keeps seeming like if, if you don't have someone to immediately step in and keep that vigor going, it regresses yes. yeah. to a worse, like, it's like when, okay, when Jesus says, you know, let's say you get rid of the spirit and clean the house, mm-hmm. but there's nothing in the house to yeah. actually fill it. So seven spirits more yeah. wicked than it come back in. Yeah. I mean, that's my eschatological position is largely founded on what Christ says in that particular Mm -hmm. moment Mm -hmm. is because it seems like even when we get something Christian that pops up on the scene, if you don't just keep the work going in that Christian, then it gets filled up with a bunch of of stuff. That's not absolutely, which again, that tension would be. So the, uh, the amillennial position will focus on the advance of the gospel and the, the visible representation of the kingdom through the That's church. Right. That's right. So through the regenerate witness, right. the post-millennial will look for other cultural structures that that are not the church That's right. as well. And right. so, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, and I, I think, yeah, I, we saw the, the last position. Yeah, goodwill triumph over evil as the millennial approaches and continues. Oh, yeah, that's that's what I was leading to. The the post millennial position ultimately is um, uh, you win you win some, you lose some, you win some, and then all of a sudden we get victory. Mm-hmm. Like nobody knows what that looks like. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows how long that's going to take. Yeah. And that's why um, when you talk to people who are post millennial, they're not there's there's not really. I don't want to say there's no sense of urgency, but there's not the same sense of urgency that there is, especially with dispensationalism. Yes. Because it's like, hey, 
Jesus is going to come steal a bunch of us at some point in time. We don't know it. We better make sure other people are ready for yeah, to get stolen. It, it, it's know. kind of ironic because there's a lot of similarities uh, with amillennial and postmillennial in culture building That's and right. in, in the slow plotting right. of um, of those kinds of things. And and I don't I don't know if this is a caricature or not. You have I will say because I've even read like Peter Lightheart Lightheart uh, who's a, a you know, post-millennial advocate, uh, sharing this own critique of his movement, mm-hmm. you have less evangelistic urgency among yes. post-millennials. Right. I don't know if that translates to all millennials as much or not. I'd say it's I think hit it and miss. depends on what flavor. Yeah, because there's, there's, there's so there's many different, different versions yeah. of that. Um, but that evangelistic zeal can get lost in the sense of we're just building a thing here, right. a Christian borough or a Christian ghetto by the right. same, you know, another <laughs> right. version of that. Um, but we're not engaging the unbelieving world right. with a gospel call to it's, faith. Whereas yeah. your dispensationalists we're gonna, are going to put oh, huge emphasis on right. that. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, my favorite, um, my favorite uh, description of the amillennial position is uh, um, life is hard and then you die. <laughs> <laughs> and then new creation. Right, right, right. But it's funny. Uh-huh. I mean, it, it is, is funny. funny. <laughs> um, so let's talk about premillennialism. And uh, in this case, historic premillennialism or what we call classic premillennialism. Yeah, because there's two, well, there's maybe more than two, but right. two main camps of premillennial. Right. Um, but and, there is yeah. more breadth. There is way more breadth in premillennial positions for all sorts of nuances. So even when you talk to somebody that you both agree that you're premillennial, that could mean a number yeah. of things. Yeah. So um, and I would say historic premillennial is actually closer to amillennial than it is to dispensational. Premillennial. Yes. Yeah. And in many in many cases, uh, covenant theology mm-hmm. kind of makes that so. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. in from there's you know even in the in the FCA, um, you can find uh, historic premills and uh, and amills that will agree on the eschatology where they even may disagree with like things like the sovereignty of God and salvation or like, you know yeah. Calvinism mm-hmm. Arminianism, yep. which is interesting, but. Um, so the millennium, uh, past, present, or future, it is future. Uh, second, um, when will Jesus return, before or after? Before. Um, number three, the uh, binding of Satan, what does that refer to? It refers to his power and presence being completely removed from the earth. Um, is it literal period of time? It may be literal or maybe fi- figurative. And this is where there's one of those, mm-hmm. like some will say, no, it's literal. Some will say it's figurative. Um Number five, what's the first resurrection? First resurrection refers to the physical resurrection of all the dead in Christ when he returns. Um, six, what is the second death? Second death, again, refers to hell, same as the, the other positions. Um, uh, what and when will the rapture be? The rapture is a public event that takes place at Christ's second coming when believers who are still living are caught up and transformed with him. And uh, what will the world be like until Christ returns? Evil will increase until Christ returns. And and it's interesting. Again, several of those are the same as as the amillennial position, like the rapture mm-hmm. as more of a welcome party slash transformation of those living. That's right. uh, same with historic premillennialism. Right. Um, the you know, in fact, I would say the the main distinctions would be the future piece. Like, is it as opposed to it being inaugurated and then, well, it's, there's two big distinctions. As opposed to it being inaugurated and then consummated when Christ returns, it's exclusively something that happens in the future. The second would be um, that uh, um, the um, good and evil increasing wheat and tares, mm-hmm. this emphasizes more that evil. The world's going to yeah. keep getting worse and worse and worse, and yeah. then Christ will return. Right. There's more an emphasis on on that, right. but it's interesting too. Like the, you know, what is the first resurrection? So the physical resurrection of the dead in Christ when He returns. That's one version of historic pre. Another would be, even seeing the second resurrection as as the the physical and the first being the the spiritual reign of the martyrs. Right, like if you right. fly really close to the grain of Revelation twenty, right. 
um, it would be the spiritual reign of the martyrs with Christ um, type thing, and is a and holding or or the physical reign of the martyrs on earth with Christ. Yeah. So as opposed to all, um, so you yeah. get, you get again, some variations it's, there. It's exegesis. Yep. It's, it's how, how, where do you land on exegesis? And, and again, and primarily in Revelation twenty with with these um, questions. Uh, let's dip into premillennialism, disp- dispensational yeah. premillennial, premillennialism. Now, when we talk about dispensation, dispensations mean uh, that God has different ways of dealing with. Uh, with people over time. Mm-hmm. And, and that's where we, when we get into talking about covenants, um, if you talk to somebody who's dispensational, there's a completely different way in which God interacts with humans over different epochs of time. So yeah. like you've got the Mosaic law, you've got the Abrahamic covenant, then, then you got the Mosaic law. He dealt with them in the Mosaic law. Then that changes when Christ comes on the scene. Mm-hmm. So there's different ways in which God, um, sort of addresses his his relationship with human yeah. beings and, based and on some it. of that actually overlaps with the sure. what would be called covenantal That's you right. know um, right. where dispensationalism is unique from covenantal is its very uh, strong emphasis on the uniqueness of ancient Israel That's right. right and the distinction between Israel and the church mm-hmm. whereas a covenantal view um, would see a closer relationship between Israel and the church in the new covenant. Uh, you're, you're, and again, even within dispensationalism, you have classical and progressive. You've That's got right. different shades even there. Um, yeah. But that, that uniqueness of Israel is kind of the hallmark of a mm-hmm. dispensational theology. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, so here's, here's uh, dispensational uh, premillennialism. When's the millennium? The millennium is a future time when God will literally fulfill his Old Testament promises to national Israel. Uh, when will Jesus return before or after? Jesus will return once at the rapture, secretly. <laughs> Sorry. And again before the millennium, uh, publicly. Uh, what does the binding of Satan refer to? The binding of Satan refers to his power and presence being completely removed from the earth. Um, uh, Thousand years literal period of time. Yes, it is a literal period of time. That's again one of the marks of of dispensationalism is there's no option for a figurative period of time. It's it's a literal thousand years. Um, first resurrection is refers to the physical resurrection of Christian martyrs and Old Testament saints. Um, what is the second death? Second death refers to hell. And what and when will the rapture be? Okay, so here's where you have now. I'm going to I'm going to say this before I, before I say this. There sometimes the the lines between dispensational premillennialism and historic premillennialism get mixed up because you can you can be in sort of a again like with progressive dispensationalism comes close to this. You can you can take a tribulation stance and not actually be dispensational. Correct. Yeah. Um, and, and so the, I think that this is not, uh, e- even the sheet's not quite, it, it gets so, it gets so muddy in some of these things. So the rapture is a secret event that takes place at Christ's first, second coming. That's <laughs> like. <laughs> Okay, uh, when the church is silently removed from the earth, and so you have a pre-tribulation, and this tribulation is it's basically a seven-year period of time where things are literally, eh, pretty literally, hell on earth for Christians. It's the people who will not uh, accept this uh, antichrist position government, who will not accept the rule of the the antichrist and the beast. They will be uh, just there will be horrible things happening. Mm-hmm. So uh, the pre-tribulation is the rapture um, happens, the rapture happens before. before the tribulation, which means God's people don't endure what dispensationalists would call, they they don't undergo the wrath of God because God's wrath will not be yeah, on his great own Great tribulation, right. whatever you think that means, right. where the church is spared from experiencing that. Right. Uh, mid-tribulation, uh, which is halfway through the tribulation, then his, so his, his God's people experience a little bit of Mm-hmm. Hard stuff, mm-hmm. and then he says, "All right, let's go," mm-hmm. and then it's done. Or post is you're you're in for all of it, and then you're gone. Where's three quarter at on this? I thing? don't know. I know where is three quarter. <laughs> and just it's to hard, clarify, it's hard to divide seven into three quarters. It, 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 just to clarify, the so this is we're talking here about the tribulation relative to the rapture. That's right. Other 
uh, that word tribulation, we alluded to this in the last um, the episode. The great tribulation. Yes. So um, your amillennialist, and I would say this might be true post, I could be corrected. Um, in your historic pre, you're going to have different positions on this in historic pre, but most of them are going to be a version of post-tribulation, not so much relative to the rapture, but because the rapture and Christ's return are really the same event mm -hmm. in amillennialism and in post-millennialism and in some, uh, and in, yeah, I would say historic pre, uh, the tribulation, they're mostly going to be post-tribulation. So mm -hmm. whatever, um, whatever the, the great tribulation is in, in terms of uh, the conflict that will happen on earth as the end approaches, mm -hmm. in those other positions, uh, the church will experience those things. Right. And, f and for an amillennial position, and I think a historic pre as well, um, that's really just another term for the church age. The right. you know, as I alluded to last week, John talks about I'm your partner at the beginning of Revelation 1, your partner in the kingdom and the tribulation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so this period of trial where, um, you know, the period of difficulty, the church will experience that. Um, a lot of positions will see it escalating right mm -hmm. at the end. Mm -hmm. um, Premillennialism is really the only one where some versions of that will, the church will be spared from that. Right. And uh, just to be more specific here, as far as dispensational premillennialism is concerned, uh, the church is raptured before a seven year tribulation, which has to do with what in Daniel uh, chapter nine, what we call the, the 70th week. Now, Again, a lot of a lot of where dispensationalists are going to get their information in terms of like how why do they talk in numbers a lot? Why 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 do you get a lot of people saying no? This is this looks like this is the time. It it really has to do with a tribulation period that that is the reign of the antichrist. It's what's happening. So it's a it's it's not just that Jesus is still governing governing. It's for a time this this the intense power is kind of turned over to to Satan and the Antichrist to, to make things very, very bad. So then the millennium, after the uh, the tribulation, then the millennium returns. And what the millennium looks like in dispensational premillennialism is that Christ returns at the end of the great tribu tribulation and then institutes a, an actual thousand-year rule from the New Jerusalem, mm -hmm. okay, uh, which, which is distinctly... Uh, Israel. I mean, dis distinctly yes. yeah. Hebraic, right? So the those, millennium those, is only for Israel, not right. for the church. Those those believing in Christ during that 70th week of Daniel who survive uh, go on to populate the earth. Uh, those raptured or raised prior to the tribulation will reign with Christ over the millennial population. So it, it, is, it, is, it is not only Israel, but it is... Israel, where it's from, is Israel, and it's it's a gathering back of distinctly ethnic. Is mm -hmm. basically uh, the way Brian Chapel says it is. Uh, it's uh, God has a plan for ethnic Israel. Mm -hmm. Is is mm -hmm. the the simple way to put it, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's that's what we're talking about when we're talking about dispensationalism, and then evil will increase until the again again until the great tribulation begins, the seven year period of satanic dominance, and then. Uh, you get Jesus, uh, and some of this would be like, you know, his feet touch the Mount of Olives. He comes back. He sets up a, 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 a actual physical reign on earth, mm -hmm. and, um, and this and, is and where this, this is, is tied, it, you know, the first... Um, for a thousand years. Yeah. yeah, for a thousand years, and it's tied specifically. The reason that this is so important to dispensationals is... The full, the literal fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies for Israel, like that's why dispensationalism has is uh, such a strong influence, mm -hmm. um, because there is a sense that if we don't, like there are promises in the Old Testament uh, about um, the reestablishment of a temple or things right. like that, right. that. Um, the, the sense is if they're not fulfilled literally and physically, then God's not keeping his word. So it comes from right. a really high view of scripture, mm -hmm. even though I would, 
I would, just to put my cards on the table, um, disagree with the interpretation of some of those passages and, and um, uh, but it, it comes out of a high view of scripture. Um, and, and so that I think is one of the things that it's commendable for, even if uh, I don't land in the same place on all those details. Yeah, it's commendable. And it's, it's you know, I, if I'm speaking plainly, God could have made this a lot easier for us to, to <laughs> if, if things weren't weird. Uh, again, you know, and I, I, I wish I could immediately, I should have written, the, written this uh, scripture reference down because I know, I know what it says. I just can't remember what specifically. Has a nation been born in a day? Um, and I, I can't remember which one of the prophets, Isaiah, I think, Isaiah, I think it is. Yeah. And, and, you know, what's tricky about that is, uh, Israel was scattered mm-hmm. and there was no national Israel until I think, was it 48, 1948, where they were reestablished yeah, after yeah, yeah. the, after the second world war because of the problems with Germany and trying mm-hmm. to kill all the Jews, which again, listen, the reason there is a lot of confusion is not just because the scriptures are hard to understand. It's because the historic events of the world have been so weird yes. that yeah. you get Israel getting scattered, okay, mm-hmm. which was, I mean, that seems to be uh, right in line with scripture. Israel is, apostatizes themselves, Jesus returns, but then you get the destruction of the temple again, like mm-hmm. in, in eighty seventy, and then it just feels like, okay, well, there's no more Israel. And then all of a sudden, 1948, after World War II, they decide, let's give them back their land. And in one day, Israel becomes a nation again. Mm-hmm. And they have been one of the smallest nations on earth, but have defended against a lot of opponents yeah. in multiple wars. And so like I, I get like if you're listening to this and you're um, I'm going to put my cards on the table. I'm a historic pre mill mm-hmm. uh, with who flirts a little bit with Amel. But, you know, just I like, keep my distance. The water you know, is good. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but part of my hesitancy to go full in Amel is because I'm I'm a little bit. Um, and again, this is not. Part uh, the largest part of it for me is how I see how I exegete the passages. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, absolutely. But the but part of it is because uh, it feels a little bit it feels a little bit crazier, yeah. you know, like That's with great. world events and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, and yeah. and I like I'm one of those guys who likes to look at things that don't make much sense and go, well, I mean, he did say that you know, he did say has a, an entire nation been born in a day. And that kind of did happen with Israel, which dispensationalists, mm-hmm. right, will take to a completely different degree. Correct, correct. So I would say... And it, and, and it happened at the Exodus. No, yeah. that's right. No, a- absolutely. Because <laughs> it's looking, yeah, absolutely. that passage is looking Absolutely. And what, what, Brandon, oh what Brandon is talking about is when we look at some of these prophetic passages, it, it could be looking back. And then the answer to all these things, all that would be you'd get you'd get a historic premillennial or, or you know yeah. uh, you'd get a premillennial saying well there's uh, multiple horizons of fulfillment for prophecy so it can be true in the past yes. and true in the future because we do that amillennials and yeah. and uh, postmillennials would do that with other passages. Every position will have a multiple horizon <laughs> right. type. You're uh, a lot right. of yeah again you're those who would see less of a unique future for 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 Israel. I think every position sees a future for ancient mm-hmm. for, for Israel in a sense. Mm-hmm. Romans 11 forces us that there is going to be some sort of influx of of ethnic Jewish believers in Christ toward the end. Mm-hmm. Whether that yeah. is a millennial reign, right. whether that is a large-scale conversion, yeah. there's lots of... Ver- but everybody sees a future for ethnic uh, Israelites. Yeah, you would have to disregard Romans 9 through 11 exactly. completely, because that would be, exactly. be too confusing. Yeah, you know, What that means, there's different yeah. views. How it's accomplished, is it accomplished through the witness of the church? That's right. Is it accomplished through the millennial reign of Christ? There's, yeah. you know, and and... So there, th- these things are, are complicated. You know, some, uh, as far as Old Testament fulfillment of Scripture, uh, I would argue a lot of the, pa- a lot of the passages that, that dispensationals look at as, um, you know, the regathering of Israel are mm-hmm. actually talking about return from exile the first mm-hmm. time, mm-hmm. not yeah. a second return from exile. Right. I don't see that there. Again, you could argue for multiple horizons. That's right. The other thing I think that's important 
there are views of the future that simply spiritualize Old Testament prophet promises. Mm -hmm. They're only mm -hmm. going to be fulfilled spiritually, not physically. Right. I would agree with dispensationals who have a hard time with that. Yeah. Um, I do think that there's a physical fulfillment, but where I see that occurring is in the new heavens and new earth rather than a parenthetical millennial reign. Mm -hmm. So putting my cards on the table, I would fall more into the all millennial camp. Right. I'm, I'm very happy with historic pre. Yeah. Um, you know, well, um, you were in the EFCA before historic pre was the, well, only yeah, but I was a covert was operative. opened. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I was, no, I wasn't covert. <laughs> I fully disclosed my position to, the church I was serving at <laughs> right, at the time right. and, and, and to the district and they had no problem with it. Yeah. Um, so, but, um, uh, cause I, I've, I've leaned more on millennial for, for a number of years yeah. and, and largely just from studying revelation. Like I sure. didn't come in with a preconceived because I came to faith, uh, a little bit later in, you know, high school grew up in college. I didn't grow up in a particular tradition that had a strong view of end time stuff. So I didn't really land on my positions until I took some exegesis classes on Revelation. Until Beale strong arm jazz. Basically, I mean, let's, <laughs> let's be honest. You know, you know, exegesis of Revelation with Greg Beale will do oh, that gosh. to a man. We had to translate the entire book of Revelation. Yeah. We had to read his entire thirteen hundred page commentary. Yeah, it's a good commentary. It's a great it's commentary. It's a great commentary. If, you, um, if you've got the time, really, that's I would I would recommend re reading. Um, get a shorter one. Yes, it, get a short one, but read he, Beals. He has two two versions. Yeah. Um, but but really, what it was is we had to write our paper on chapter twenty, mm -hmm. and so I didn't have a position until I had. And and the first thing I realized in writing that paper and doing my research was. Anybody who makes a position on the millennium, a litmus test for orthodoxy, mm -hmm. has never actually studied this passage carefully. Oh, it is no, tricky. Yeah, it, it is, is tricky. difficult. Yeah, it is really hard. So we have to have room for grace on people landing in different places than right. us. Um, but but by you know that's where I came out in the and, and largely was the structure of Revelation as a recapitulative structure as yeah. opposed to a chronological structure. Yeah. That's. You know, comes down to the structure of the book. That's why I landed where I landed. Right, right. And and well, Andrew uh, hermeneutic. Yes, right? I would. Like, I would and, say absolutely. So, like, that's like, again, like, uh, you could. Now, this is not going to be. It's not going to be as precise as I would want it to be. But like, um, for dispensationals, they're going to say they're strict literalist. Mm -hmm. Like, as they look at the passages, when they look at numbers, when they look at the passages in Daniel and passages yeah. in Revelation, they're going to say this is what it says. No, with no breadth for, um, well, now they would say, but no breadth for like, this is metaphorical or mm -hmm. this is allegorical or it's like, this is a literal, whereas here, historic premills would be grammatico historical, yeah. right? So there's, it's like, it's, you're looking at the text, but you're also looking at like, you're looking at how does the genre operate? That's right. That's and so right. some genres, I would argue a literal reading of revelation requires me to take certain things metaphorically. Well, and redemptive historical would be a nonmillennial position. Yeah. yeah and, right. and that's how the genre of apocalyptic works. Right. It's using intentionally using symbolic language. And, right. and some of that, you know, is just plain to see the lampstands in chapter one are interpreted as churches in chapters two and three. We're told that. Right. Uh, and so when lampstands show up in chapter 11, yeah, it makes sense that they would be referring to churches there, right. the witness of churches. And so, so we do that. So, and the other thing would be looking at, again, context, like how uh, Revelation uses a lot of Old Testament imagery. Mm -hmm. What was that imagery doing in the Old Testament? Right. How does that inform what it means in yeah. Revelation? Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's trying to fly closer to the grain of the text mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how the text is designed to operate mm -hmm. versus, I would say, a... Uh, uh, imposing a rigid hermeneutic on texts that actually don't function that way. Right. Right. So. Yeah. And again, like a lot of that, a lot of that is going to come down to, again, the, the hermeneutic that you're using. Yeah. I, and I, I think what we're advocating for here is, um, again, not, not thinking that there's one position has everything all locked up. Yeah, there are okay. problems with every single position. Right, and and yeah. I can, you know, I can, I, I'll just throw some of these out. First of all, let me make, a, again, another plea. 
I, we would encourage you to read the literature and find out for yourself too. And if you're like, Hey, I've tried reading these and maybe doing a little bit of study and figuring it out on my own, we would say you need help. Okay. So like you need to check out the different positions and the different approaches and then decide and pray prayerfully decide where you might land on. Again, I, if you're looking for a, his, uh, I feel like the most accessible and a really good commentary for historic pre-mill would be Grant Osborne's yep. uh, commentary on revelation. Uh, Beal is going to be just a great resource if you're if you're looking to the amillennial position and again. I, don't get the full one yeah, because you'll, your brain bridged. will break. Yep, you'll need help. You'll Henriksen need a class. Henriksen is also good. That's right. On, on good. amillennial. Yeah. Uh, Post millennial. Um, oh shoot. Uh, um, Funny, there's not a lot of revelation. No, there is, and it's a uh, it's an older post. one, and I can't. I'll have to go back to it. And uh, he's getting most post millennials. I'll post it. Don't get there from Revelation. They get there from a broader biblical. That's theology. right, a, a much broader brush. Theology. Yeah, you're committed to a, you're committed to a overall um, again a, an overall approach mm-hmm. that then strongly informs that, what you're doing. That's when you come driven to more yeah. by your interpretation of how Christ reigns right. than it is any particular passage of Scripture. Yeah, right. and and dispensational. I'm just going to I'm just going to put out there that dispensational to me is less influenced. First of all, it was a it was a relative. Some people will try to say dispensationalism has been around since like early. It, it's not. It's not true. It's not true. <laughs> it was it was a very recent kind of turn of the century. 1800s. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. John uh, Nelson John Nelson Darby. Mm-hmm. He um, popularized. It was around before him, but he popularized right. it. Right, Niagara Bible Conference. The um, like. It, it is it is the the newest and I would say has as far as pop Christian culture has become one of the most popular with your for, left behind series right. is a good example yeah, of please that. please don't get your theology from left behind <laughs> I, I if you've watched it you love that movie I love you please understand I hate that movie and <laughs> any any iteration of that movie <laughs> with books <laughs> yeah I, it was the reason that was one of the reasons that uh, when george bush uh, announced it, when i was in middle school that we were going into war in iraq i was absolutely convinced that the world was ending and i'm almost 47 now so <laughs> and and one one appeal i would make because the relationship between the church and israel is a super important question and a tricky one yep. too and, and it, it's one where people are going to, you know, is there a, a complete melding of them or mm-hmm. is there a complete distinction? Mm-hmm. What I would advocate to people to consider is that you're leaving out the linchpin between the two. Mm-hmm. The real question is, what's the relationship between Israel and Jesus? Right. And what's the relationship between Jesus and the church? Right. When we try and answer the question about the relationship between Israel and the church, but we're not looking at, at Jesus, Jesus. Yeah you're going to land in all sorts of weird places, yes. in my opinion. Yes. Is, is Jesus true Israel? Is he the fulfillment of it? And then, and again, looking at Ephesians 2, looking right. at, at uh, other places, Romans 9 to 11, uh, you don't erase the ethnic categories between Jew and Gentile, mm-hmm. but the church is a Jew-Gentile entity, according to Ephesians sure, that's, 2. There's that's clear. one new humanity in right. Christ. Right. That has to bear weight on our understanding between the church and Israel. Yeah. Um, and yeah. and uh, so l- focus on the relationship between those two things and Jesus, and that's going to bring so much more clarity to how we understand Old Testament prophecy, how we understand eschatological promises. Yeah. That, I think, is a critical um, key. Yeah, and some people, some people will um, accuse amillennialists and, and historic premills of being replacement theologians. Yeah, that's not but that's, that's a that's There a are terrible, replacement there, theologians there out are, there. There are, but not wrong. every, but not, <laughs> right, and but not everybody who who is talking about Israel and the church as being together is trying to replace Correct. Israel. Correct. Like we're, that's it, not what's happening. That's the fulfillment of God's promise. That's right. That's right. Are, so are the better categories. And you right. look at first Peter two, mm-hmm. where Peter uses all the language of ancient Israel's identity, but he includes the church in that. He doesn't replace Israel with the church. He includes Gentile believers and yeah. Jewish believers because Jesus is new is now the linchpin. Right. If we're in him, we're part of that. Uh, the com- how does he put it in Ephesians two? The the household of God, the mm-hmm. commonwealth of of 
Um, we're no longer strangers. Uh, I should just turn there, but read um. Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. <laughs> You'll see what I'm talking about. Um, again, and, you know, even like as Brandon and I sit here and talk, Brandon and I are going to um, disagree is not even the right word. Because it's not important enough for me to be like, Brandon, we really need to talk about where we mm-hmm. land on this stuff. Like, and even if we're going to preach a text, you know, if we're going to make sure that we are um, faithful to say, here's my position, but yeah. I would welcome you to understand. So even even uh, as as a historic premill, like some of the objections to historic premillennialism, I have to be honest about First Corinthians first uh, 15, when Paul says death is defeated when Christ returns, basically. Okay, mm-hmm. so if that's true, then... Then you should be. Then there mill. can't be any more death on the earth. And if there's a physical kingdom that goes on for a thousand years, obviously death is not defeated. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, in the yeah, sense, yeah. in the sense that that it seems to say that in, and flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. So what does that mean when there's a physical kingdom of God on the earth? Mm-hmm. So is the kingdom of God spiritual or is it physical? And if it's physical, then how is it that flesh and blood can yeah. be in that kingdom? Uh, yeah. Romans Romans eight eighteen through twenty three is another one. Second Peter three. Um, uh, like eight through 13, uh, the day of the Lord, like when the day of the Lord comes, there's present heaven and earth are destroyed. So what do we do with that? So when Jesus returns and he comes with flaming fire and vaporizes these things, what does yeah. that mean for the historic pre I have to be able to yeah. answer those questions and, and wrestle with those things and even come back and check my own position yeah. on that. Do I think that, uh, that uh, there's going to be a, a, a plan for ethnic Israel? I do based again on a, f- a few texts here and there, like when I look at Daniel, when I look at Romans 9 through 11 and how I interpret that, when I look at Revelation, I see that. But if I'm honest, I kind of want to see that too because my sure. my own heart will give me away to that. So I can't be so committed to... One of the things that we all have to do is make sure that our, our desire, that we're not drawn to a hermeneutic by what we want to be true, yeah. but we come to it willing to say, I might be wrong on this. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And if we're not willing to do that, then whatever position that we have, I think we're going to, we're, we're going to kind of shortcut what, absolutely. what Christ wants to do in us in terms of like mission. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. <sighs> It's a lot. It's a lot. We could go Congratulations on. Congratulations if you've listened this far. Oh my gosh. We, we could go on. Um, I think, I think for now, Maybe we'll let's cascade next week, and if we can, uh, we'll button it up and talk a little bit about more of the practical implications of how do we see, like how do we, how do we handle ourselves? Can we do? Some, and I'm doing it on the fly. I haven't even cleared this with you already, but <laughs> but next week we've talked a little bit about like even uh, how uh, Christians handle politics and approach mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. nervousness. Like, what mm-hmm. are the, all these things? Like, Russia just sent two submarines off the coast of Cuba. Like, what are we supposed to do with that? Mm-hmm. Is the world war, you know, is is the next world war coming? Like, and and how as Christians do we maintain? Uh, I would like a a a vibrant uh, um, a vibrant hopeful view yeah. of Christ's return. Yeah. Um, with all these things floating around. I think that's a great subject. Okay. The, the practical application of our eschatology to world events. Because that's the most and important so, yeah, part. And, and that's what a lot of people sit around are arguing with. with each other. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's great. That's All great. right. Well, again, take uh, take what you've heard today. If you need to read through it, uh, listen through it a few times. Um, I'm going to include uh, a couple of recommendations on uh, commentaries for Revelation according mm-hmm. to the different positions. I'll, I'll uh, drop a couple there. So check the show notes for that. Um, if you have any questions, obviously we can't cover everything. If, if you have a position and you're arguing with us about like... Um, uh, well, you were wrong on this. You didn't include this. Obviously, we couldn't get there. This would have been a seven-hour podcast. Um, so please send us your questions, uh, and we'd be happy to talk about those things. Uh, thanks for joining us today. You're troopers, man. This one, you're really, really troopers. So I look forward to talking to you again next week. Until then, uh, stay in the word. Let it get into you. See you later. Amen.